Hello, this is going to be the second video in this series on critical transitions, studying the topic of critical slowing down specifically. Now before I explain the math behind critical slowdown, I think it's a good idea if I go over a couple of definitions. We had the definition of a dynamical system, which is any system that can be represented by the rate of change of its state is defined to be simply a function of the state and time, where x represents the state of the system. Now, in this series, we're mostly going to study systems which are time independent, so it'll just be a function of the state itself. We then had the definition of a bifurcation. Now, given that this is a function of the state x, which we've written along the x-axis here, there can be other parameters in this function, like if it was a quadratic, we could have coefficients in, in front of each term in the quadratic equation. And changing the values of those coefficients or parameters can cause the function to change, and therefore the fixed points where the rate of change is zero will change as well. In fact, they can be annihilated. Like here, what you can do for a function that looks like this, as I showed in the previous video, is by changing the parameters, you can cause a stable and an unstable fixed point to move together by kind of raising this graph up at which point they will collide and annihilate, and you will be left with only the upper stable fixed point, which is what I've drawn on this graph here. So that's what a bifurcation is. So in this lecture series, we're going to be studying what happens when a bifurcation can cause a switch in the stability of your system that could ha potentially have catastrophic impacts. So if we were, say, in some system where we wanted to be in this stable state, but we definitely don't want to be in this stable state, then what can happen is, without us really being aware of it, changing the parameters in the function which defines the dynamical system can change this graph and annihilate this stable state, which will force us, when we're in this situation, to move to the upper stable state. And that could, for some reason, which we will see in later videos, have really devastating impact. So that's something which we want to be aware of before it happens. So is there a way of us finding out that this is going to happen? Well, there is. There's a way of testing whether or not we're near a bifurcation point, and that's called critical slowing down. It's the phenomenon that I'm going to be explaining in this video. So let's go into critical slowing down. So making sure that we are defining properly everything that we're going to be using in order to study critical slowing down. We need to have a dynamical system, so that's something given by rate of change of state variable x is a function of that state variable x. And this has to have two real roots in order for there to be a bifurcation, because we have to have at least a stable and an unstable fixed point, which a change in parameters in the function will cause them to collide and annihilate which will force us to go to a different point of stability. So this function has to have at least two real roots. And for those stable and unstable fixed points to annihilate, those two roots, as in places where the function is equal to zero, have to be next to each other. So I'm going to call these two roots, or stable and unstable fixed points, x1 and x2, where x1 is stable, and x2 is unstable. And then a bifurcation can annihilate x1 and x2. Now, the phenomenon of critical slowing down is to do with how quickly we recover from small perturbations around the stable equilibrium, which we've decided we want to call x1. And basically what we're going to find is, as we get closer to a bifurcation, as in as x1 and x2 get closer and closer together, then if we kind of have some perturbations or fluctuations around the stable equilibrium, 
then as we get close to the bifurcation, the recovery rate from those fluctuations is going to decrease. Now, the way that we're going to write that mathematically is that we're going to write our state, which is x, just the state variable in here, as x1, which is the stable equilibrium, plus some perturbation term, epsilon, where epsilon obviously has to be small, or relatively small compared to the size of x1 and x2. So now, given that we're writing our state x as a perturbation around the fixed point x1, then we originally had that the function of x was just defining the rate of change of the state, although I'd written it the other way around originally. But um, rather than writing x in these two terms, we can instead write what we've turned x into, which is x1 plus the perturbation epsilon. So if I write the rate of change of the state, which is the stable equilibrium plus the perturbation, is then equal to the function of the state, which again, is the stable equilibrium plus the perturbation. So now what I'm going to do is try and fiddle with both sides in order to get something that looks nicer so that I can work out what's happening with epsilon over time. So on this side, given that epsilon is small, I'm going to use a Taylor expansion and we'll see that all of that is going to simplify for epsilon being small. So if I write that out. So this is what we get when we use a Taylor expansion. Now, in order to do a Taylor expansion, we take a function written in terms of a variable and we try and write it around a point. We say that we write the Taylor expansion to be about some point. So here, we're obviously going to use the fixed point x1. So basically, we're turning the function from being in terms of variations x into variations around x1. You can look up the definition of the Taylor expansion. I've just written some of the terms out here so that we can see what's going on. So first of all, you get the function at the place that you're expanding around. And then you take the derivative at the place that you're expanding around times by the variable minus the fixed point, which is the place that we're expanding around. Now, obviously, x1 cancels, so that just becomes epsilon. And then for the higher order terms, we get the same thing. We'll get left with some power of epsilon. But because epsilon is small, we can basically say that this will go to zero, and so will the higher order terms as well. So we'll just get left with this term, which is basically linear in terms of epsilon, which looks like that. The function at fixed point x1 plus epsilon times the first derivative of the function at x1. So now what we're going to do is simplify the left-hand side and we'll see that we get something very nice. So we've Taylor expanded the right-hand side and the left-hand side is this time derivative. This just comes from the original definition that the time derivative of x is a function of x, but with the transformation that x, which had been a function of time, is now a constant x1 plus epsilon as a function of time. So then when we expand out the left-hand side, that's a constant and that's a function of time. So we just end up getting zero plus d epsilon by dt. And that's equal to the Taylor expansion, which we have calculated. f of x1 plus epsilon f prime of x1. But remember from the original definition again, x1 is a fixed point, which means that the rate of change there is zero, i.e. the value of the function is zero. So that also goes to zero. And we get left with this very nice differential equation in terms of epsilon. And with this constant in here. Now for any given conditions, this will be constant. And I'm going to call that lambda. And basically, when we get close to a bifurcation point, the gradient, which is this term, is going to go to zero. So lambda will go to zero. So just using this constant lambda, which will be a real number close to zero, we get a differential equation which will now solve d epsilon by dt is equal to lambda epsilon.
So solving this differential equation for epsilon as a function of t is very simple. Just change the variables to each side and then integrate. You get uh, 1 over epsilon d epsilon is equal to lambda dt. Integrate on both sides. And then that will give us ln epsilon is equal to lambda t plus some constant. And then if you raise both sides to the, by as an exponential of e, the exponential constants, which is the base that we're using for this logarithm, then you get epsilon is equal to this is going to end up being an e to the power of c, so I'm just going to call that constant a, big A, e to the power of lambda t. Now, when t is zero, then this epsilon as a function of t is just going to be whatever the term is for the perturbation at t equals zero. So specifically, I can write this as epsilon as a function of t is equal to whatever the perturbation is when the time is zero times e to the power of lambda t. Now, as you can see, this is an exponential equation. And lambda is going to be the exponential growth or decay rate. So let's try and work out, does that mean it's going to grow or decay? It will make much more sense when I start writing out what um, these bifurcations have to look like. So basically, this is what we've got to. We're considering some dynamical system which is about to undergo a bifurcation. So the stable and unstable equilibrium have come close together and are almost at the point of annihilating. So that's kind of what I've tried to draw in this graph here. Um, it, we're just working with an arbitrary system, so I've drawn the one which I was originally using, but this could have more intersections with the x-axis or it could have fewer. As long as we have at least a stable and an unstable equilibrium, we will still be able to observe bifurcations for some parameters. Now, basically, we've solved for epsilon, where epsilon zero is kind of the initial perturbation. So we're kind of perturbing away from the stable equilibrium by an amount epsilon naught. And then we want to know how is that going to recover over time? Obviously, this is a stable equilibrium. So we would expect the state, which is written in terms of variable x, to return to the stable equilibrium over time. But is there anything more to it than that? Well, yes, there is. You'll notice that for a stable equilibrium, the gradient of this function, which defines the rate of change, has to be negative through the stable equilibrium, because by definition, a stable equilibrium had to have a positive rate of change before it and a negative rate of change after it. So given that we wrote lambda as the gradient of that function at the stable equilibrium x1, this means that lambda has to be less than zero because the value of this gradient has to be less than zero, has to be negative. So given that lambda in this equation is less than zero, this function is going to define an exponential decay. Um, as a quick reference, an exponential decay graph looks something like that. So if we started off at epsilon naught, we're going to get closer and closer to zero over time. So that means that for perturbations around the stable equilibrium, we will return to the equilibrium by an exponential decay process. But more interestingly, what happens to the rate of this exponential decay when we get close to that bifurcation? Well, as we get closer and closer to the bifurcation, these two points on the graph are going to get closer and closer together. And we do that by kind of modifying the shape of the graph to bring this local minimum upwards, which means that these two points are going to get closer and closer to a local minimum. And as they get closer to the local minimum, the gradient at the stable and the unstable fixed point as well has to get closer and closer to zero. So as we approach the bifurcation, the magnitude of the gradient, and therefore the magnitude of lambda, the rate of exponential decay, has to decrease to zero. So getting closer and closer to the bifurcation, we will see 
x1 and x2 become very close together, this minimum becomes very close to the x-axis, which means that the gradient through this place, the stable equilibrium, is going to get very close to zero, which means that the rate of exponential decay, i.e. the recovery rate back to stable equilibrium of these perturbations, is also going to go to zero. So what I'm going to do now is go through a very simple example which looks a little bit like this but it's only a quadratic equation rather than a cubic equation just to kind of prove that the gradient for a typical example will go to zero when we get close to a bifurcation point. So the example that I'm going to use is this quadratic equation. It's the, the rate of change of the state variable x with respect to time is this, which if I expand it out, I will get gamma x squared minus a plus b gamma x plus a b gamma. Now this is obviously defined to be the function of x, because f of x is just the function of the state which we're using to define the rate of change of that state. So in the previous generalization which I gave, we wanted to know what the derivative was at the stable equilibrium. Now, given that I have two roots a and b, I'm just going to, for convenience, write that a is less than b, which basically means that a is going to be the stable equilibrium, b is going to have to be the unstable equilibrium. So I'm going to be looking for what is the value of the derivative of the function at a. And that's what we will plug in to find the value of lambda that defines the recovery rate from perturbations. Now, this is the expansion of the function. So if I take the derivative of that, f prime of x is going to be equal to 2 gamma x minus a plus b gamma. The x just becomes a constant here, and this constant gets differentiated to 0. So if I write that out, I get 2 gamma x minus a gamma minus b gamma. So then clearly if I take f prime at a, plug a in as our value of x here, and that cancels with, with this a gamma, so I get left with a gamma, or at least some of this cancels with the a gamma. f prime of a is equal to a gamma minus b gamma which is just a minus b all multiplied by gamma. Now if a is less than b, which we use to define a to be the stable equilibrium, then that means that this is going to be zero, and therefore this gradient, which we had said was lambda, is going to be less than zero. Now as a and b get closer together, this bracket is going to become closer and closer to zero, so therefore close to a bifurcation where a and b come close together and then collide and annihilate, then given that the gradient is going to go to zero, which was f prime of a, then that means that lambda, the exponential recovery rate or decay rate for perturbations, also has to go to zero. So that gives an explanation for this specific example of why when we get close to a bifurcation when the stable and unstable equilibrium collide the recovery rate has to go to zero. So to try and talk about that a bit more intuitively basically these systems if they were to represent a real dynamical system then that implies that as we get close to a bifurcation, which could potentially have catastrophic consequences, any perturbation which might occur naturally or by human interaction around the stable equilibrium will recover much slower when we get close to that bifurcation point. Clearly, if I'm at the stable equilibrium, A in this case, and I perturb by some value epsilon, initially epsilon zero, then that perturbation as a function of time is going to be the initial perturbation times some exponential decay. But if lambda is going to zero, 
then this is going to go to one and our perturbation is going to be constant or at least recover much, much slower. So if we're close to this potentially catastrophic bifurcation, then for natural or man-made perturbations around the stable equilibrium, the recovery rate back to equilibrium is much slower. So we can use that to predict whether or not we're at a point which is close to a bifurcation, or as we're kind of calling in this series, a critical transition, because we're specifically looking for scenarios in which these bifurcations could have catastrophic implications for a real system. So just as another quick visualization of that, basically what's happening is we're at the stable equilibrium, we perturb, and then we obviously recover back to the stable point. But when lambda goes to zero, as in this gradient goes to zero, we will recover much slower. So if I wanted to test whether or not I was getting close to a bifurcation that could cause a critical transition, then I could cause a perturbation and see whether I recover back to the stable equilibrium quickly. And if I recover more slowly than I would have expected, that's potentially a warning signal that I'm close to a bifurcation and there is a risk of a critical transition occurring, which could have some nasty implication like an outbreak of some pests or a disease or some kind of financial collapse, or in thermal physics, it could be something like an explosion, which could be caused. So for the rest of this series, I'm going to go over some ways of kind of statistically studying this phenomenon of critical slowing down. And then I'm going to give examples of real world systems where critical slowing down, as in slow recovery rate of perturbations from stable equilibrium has actually been observed so that we can try and understand better how we can use the knowledge of this phenomenon to predict and potentially prevent catastrophic occurrences in real dynamical systems.